Alrighty. Aloha students, here we go. Um, I just want to sort of continue with this discussion uh, what the Industrial Revolution uh, brought to the world, both good and bad. Uh, so one of the things we've just sort of done is we've talked about uh, Karl Marx. And I think uh, Karl Marx is certainly a product of the Industrial Revolution because of what he saw. And we talked about the negatives of industrial, uh, industrialization. Uh, so now what I want to do is I want to counter that and I want to give you the opposite viewpoint. Uh, so you had Marxism, Mar Karl Marx and Marxism, and now I want to talk about uh, the opposite. This is uh, one of the guys, Adam Smith today, our discussion today. I think there are two people in American and U.S. history that are extremely important in U.S. history that most Americans have never heard of. One of which we were introduced to, uh, he was a philosoph of the Enlightenment, his name was John Locke. And this, to me, is the second guy who is super influential on American history that most Americans have never heard of, and his name is Adam Smith. So we're going to see uh, he's very different than Karl Marx. The two thought processes are opposite, and then when we're done with this kind of sort of conversation, we will do something called, we will compare the two in any charts. Okay, so here we go. All right, the way we're going to sort of do this is we're going to do two things at once. You've also been given uh, this handout. It's called... Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, okay, and this might be a little tricky to see up here, but what we're going to do is uh, we're going to read this together, we're going to use a highlighter uh, to get uh, complete it, okay, so uh, the Wealth of Nations is the book that this guy Adam Smith wrote, so here we go, uh, the spirit of freedom and confidence expressed in the American colonies, North, British North American colonies during the 1700s reflected a fresh and optimistic and vigorous view of life held by an increasing number of people. Traders and manufacturers had grown impatient with the existing, what we will call, this may be a new term for you, maybe not, mercantilist system, okay? Mercantilist, what the heck is that? Uh, business operators felt frustrated and hindered by the direction and control of economic life exercised by the national government, okay? Uh, in this case, the crown rule of the English king and the English parliament. All right, so... Uh, we're talking about, let's go through this briefly, we're talking about the 13 original colonies that become the United States of America during the 1700s. Uh, there was a system in which the business owners of the colonies were frustrated, felt frustrated, hindered by the direction and control of the English king and the English parliament. I think these are things you know because of the number of times you've uh, studied U.S. history. They wanted more freedom to pursue their own personal advantage. Many people in the colonies and in England, to be honest with you, felt they were not getting the rewards to which their efforts entitled them. And still they, instead, they felt the rewards went to the state. Okay, so, you know, we kind of understand this is that that is what sort of feudalism, uh, most of ancient history, that's what it was all about. Uh, things were run by the state. All right? Such persons believed that by seeking their own advantage in business, the entire nation would prosper. In other words, so let's do this. In other words, by helping oneself, one helped the nation. All right, so this is opposite of uh, helping the nation directly. This is helping the nation by helping yourself first. This new feeling was ex best expressed by the Scottish economist and philosopher, a guy named Adam Smith. You can see those are his years. His book, The Wealth of Nations, published in, in 1776, captured the imagination of Europe and America and by, became by far the most influential work ever written by an economist. Okay, Smith's philosophy of freeing merchants and traders from government restrictions was called, let's, let's do that whole, it's called, this is pronounced laissez-faire, Smith's philosophy of freeing merchants and traders from government restrictions was called laissez-faire. It's a French term that means allow them to do or leave alone. All right, it's not Specifically, what uh, you know, uh, this is not a term that Adam Smith invented. This is a French word. This is a French term, French words. All right, but that's what it means, and this was what Smith used to apply his thought process. Smith Smith's book dominated economic thought for the next 150 years, particularly among the young and ambitious British North American colonies and the new nation they would become. Adam Smith believed, along with the writers of the U.S. Constitution, that human behavior followed certain laws of nature. Now this may sound familiar to you. These are the same this sort of this term might sound familiar to you. 
same term, laws of nature and nature's God that Jefferson referred to in the Declaration of Independence. One of these was the concept of self-interest. All right, what the heck is self-interest? Laws of self -interest. Smith believed that people engage in trade and manufacturing for their own profits, not for the sake of the nation or to benefit others. Okay, now I think this probably makes sense to you. Why does somebody start a business? Why does somebody try to dream up some product to uh, sell to people or some service to perform for people? Well, what are they doing it for? They're trying to make money. I mean, let's be honest with each other. That's why people do this. Yeah, I want to make money for who? For me. It's my self-interest that I'm trying to make this money. I'm not really thinking about benefiting anybody else except me. But, now you may say, well, yeah, of course, that's, that's selfish. Okay, but hold on a second. Uh, Smith believed in that a... Okay, here we go. Nevertheless, Smith believed that a selfish foundation of a business was actually a good thing. He said that in a nation where everyone was allowed to seek his or her own personal advantage, everyone would automatically also contribute to the prosperity of the nation. Uh, let's highlight that sentence right there. He said, uh, the second full sentence, everyone would automatically contribute to the benefit of the nation. The skilled worker who could command high wages, the manufacturer of cheaper goods, the trader who selected merchandise that would please customers all were seeking their own profit. I don't think anybody would deny that. But they were also performing a useful service and or providing a useful product that benefited the society as, as a whole. This is a term that we associated with Adam Smith. It's called the invisible hand. It was this, it was, it is as if an invisible hand were turning the individual self-interest into the common good. So we'll highlight that. We're turning the individual self-interest into the common good. A well a well governed nation, Smith believed, would encourage the natural forces of self interest, limit them only when they violated the principles of justice. Okay, so here we go. Let's continue with this uh, just a little bit further here. Let me make sure I am right. Okay, I'm good to go. Mercantilism, the economic system that dominated Europe in Smith's day, represented the opposite view of what he considered a natural system. The wealth of nations, Smith in the wealth of nations, Smith blasts not only the mass mercantilist controls over commerce, but also the monopolies and the privileges granted by governments to certain groups and individuals. These he believed only frustrated nature. He was a believer in the importance of rivalry. Okay, without rivalry of other competitor uh, competitors, privileged traders, producers, and merchants grew lazy and arrogant. This resulted in shoddy goods and services, lower profits, and therefore a poor nation. Okay? All right. Let's go to the next. That, does that make sense? What I just said right there. Rivalry was good. Okay? In the mercantilist system, the, the government tried to eliminate competition to itself. With rivalry, where you have private, uh, private ownership, rivalry forces two different companies, for example that make the same product to make sure that that product is not is in top shape and not for very expensive. And so therefore, the consumer and what he is arguing, Smith is arguing, the nation as a bet, as a whole will uh, do better. All right, let's move on to the next page here. Here we go, we're on the downhill uh, slide of this. We're on the downhill slide of this. All right, uh, calling for an end to, mercantilist syst uh, uh, to mercantilism he proposed a free choice of occupation. All right, and again, you have to remember that coming out of the Middle Ages, coming out of Middle Ages Europe, this was a big deal, because in Middle Ages Europe, and really for much of history, uh, you, your, your craft, what you did for a living, was what your parents, did, what your parents did for a living. If your father was a blacksmith, you were a blacksmith. If your, uh, if your father made roofs. You made roofs. That's just the way it was. Okay, so Smith was against that. Mercantilism liked that. It can control things. So what does Smith do? He urges the abolition of government apprenticeship rules and laws restricting settlements in certain parts of the country. He attacked duties, which is a tax, bounties, monopolies of chartered government-sponsored companies, such as those that operate in the British colonies in North America. However, even as he denounced these hindrances to trade, Smith realized that he, they played a crucial role in the economy of Great Britain of his day. 
With this in mind, he advised it should be lifted gradually whenever a quick repeal would cause serious unemployment. He also thought it was that it was unrealistic to expect a completely free trade or laissez-faire system would ever be established in Great Britain. This is just implying, okay, you can't just turn the you can't just turn one thing off and turn one thing on the next day. That's basically what he's getting at. He says, from mercantilism to a laissez-faire society has got to be a slow process. In book five of The Wealth of Nations, this is very important, and this is something that, uh, one of the main reasons that Smith is, remains extremely popular today is this concept of three roles of government. All right, And you're going to see, this is really sort of my point here, this is really demonstrating the difference between Marx and Smith. You'll see that this is the this is the epitome of limited government. Uh, three roles of government in a laissez-faire society. Smith restricts the government to three functions, and really three functions only. National defense, number one. Enforcement of laws, number two, that protect life and property. And number three, construction and maintenance of public works that might be highly useful to everyone, but not profitable enough, profit, profitable enough for private builders. And he had several lists here. If you think about these, roads, bridges, canals, harbors, uh, schools to some degree, what do these things do? These things make sure that goods and services keep moving, here's the key word right here, moving efficiently. You gotta have good roads, you gotta have good bridges, you gotta have good canals to make sure that the movement of goods and services, traded goods, those types of things, all is efficient. All right, uh, let's sort of uh, just sort of briefly go through here. Uh, here you have it. The government, oh, I'm gonna actually end with this. The government's particular uh, participation in the affairs of the country should be the exception rather than the rule. This allows this natural liberty that he talked about, human's nature, natural way of doing things, would solve the problems. Okay, all right, so I'll let you read the rest of that on your own. Let's take a look at a blank piece of paper here of our, uh, let's continue with a blank piece of paper and do some things here about Adam Smith more specifically. More specifically, so here we go. Let's write this down. So first of all, let's let's uh, we've sort of touched on uh, in mercantilism. Okay, here we go. So let's write this stuff down, shall we? So we sort of touched on mercantilism when we talked about colonialism, and I sort of made the argument that uh, uh, colonial. We, we heard the ter term colonialism. You, you know, imperial imperialism, the growth of empires. Okay, mercantilism should really be, sort of be thrown into that. If you review that failure of colonialism uh, movie, you'll see that that is in there. And really, what it's talking about, mercantilism tries to uh, uh, is a system where a nation tries to increase its power by increasing the amount of territory it controls. And of course, it's not just territory. It's not just we say we have all this territory. It's the things that come with it. It's the things underneath the land the you know we think of mining of course and we think of gold and silver etc but it can be the things on the land it can be lumber it can be trees and lumber for example that's something else but the point is is that these colonial creating nations and again these are mostly european nations at first but this will change as time goes along uh this is what mercantilism is we think about the mother country in the case of the 13 british colonies well what's the mother nation well the Brit, the england is and my point is, is that Smith, even though he's from the British, he's sort of, I mean, it's interesting because he's similar to the philosophers of the Enlightenment. You know, he, here's Smith, a pretty well-off guy from the British Empire, but he's railing against it, just like the philosophers of France uh, railed against the French system. Uh, so now let's go through a couple of these as well, just to make sure we get it. The law of self-interest, all right? An individual engages in business for the benefit of himself or herself however what does this business uh, the only way this business can be successful is if the good or services benefits others so many people who make this argument uh, and they talk about the role of uh, uh, self-interest they they argue that look this is really what capitalism is all about okay so 
one of the things that uh, one of the, the people people today that love Adam Smith love capitalism and they love uh, freedom of choice and freedom of occupation. We call it a free enterprise system, uh, open free markets. This is what this is one of the arguments that they make is that this is natural. The other argument that they that this is comp this is what exactly would ha is happening automatically without even thinking about it. That's why it was called. Uh, that's why it was called the invisible hand. One of the arguments that a capitalist would make is that capitalism is a system with two thank yous. How about that? There's two thank yous. All right. The uh, business owner says thank you to the customer for choosing my bus uh, my product or service. The customer says thank you to the owner because why? Because the customer is grateful for the product or service. And the, by the way, the customer was free to choose, not uh, the free had free freedom of choice of where they would get the product or service. So this is a system with two thank yous. The argument is is that socialism doesn't have that. Socialism has only doesn't have any thank yous in the system. So let's do this. Let's say laissez faire. We make sure we uh, d define laissez faire. All right, this is a very important uh, concept uh, to leave alone to be left alone to stay out of the affairs of business. Of course, he said that rivalry was good. I explained that, how rivalry is important. Uh, rivalry uh, makes you up your game, doesn't it? Uh, rivalry f forces you to get better, doesn't it? Um, okay. Uh, and then government roles, just what we just sort of said just a moment ago, sort of uh, the three things, national defense, enforcing laws, and then maintaining public works. And then briefly, let's just do this. What is the importance of Adam Smith? I'll just make sort of three points here, and then we'll make a chart together comparing Marx and Smith. We'll finish with that. Uh, Smith is a hero to people who love capitalism. All right? Uh, Marx is a hero to people who love socialism. Smith is a hero to people who love capitalism. Uh, Smith is very popular. Uh, as you, as I just mentioned, okay, uh, people who love capitalism, people who <coughs> believe in free enterprise, and that of course means freedom of occupation, freedom to do business with who you choose, freedom of contract, open markets. Uh, if I don't like the price of something over here, I can go over there to try to get the same product for a cheaper price. I can. This is also something to do with freedom of. Uh, freedom of choice as far as who you want to deal with. And then I would say, whereas, uh, I would say, whereas, you, if you think about Marx and socialism, that's, uh, I, I suppose, you know, you make the argument that socialism is a left side of the political spectrum. It's an economic system on the left side. And liberals are more socialist in nature. Our uh, extreme liberals, liberals are very much socialist in nature. Whereas Smith believes what Smith believes in the size of government, especially the limited size of government, that's certainly conservative in nature. Okay? All right, so now let's do this. And what I'm going to call this chart is I'm going to call it Marxism versus... Now, this is not... A, Marxism is a term that is uh, used and uh, well-known and used often. You don't really hear the word Smithism. All right? But that's what I'm going to call this... And what we're going to do is we're going to see that this is basically a two-column chart. Uh, Marxism stuff, Smithism stuff on this side. Okay, so, you know, I think there are several things you sort of think about as you go through here. And first of all, it would be sort of economics. How's that sound? And I would just sort of say, I think this is probably the most obvious thing, is this idea between socialism and capitalism. Now, hopefully you've seen the uh, movie uh, comparing these two. If you need more details about these two things and how to compare them, I would recommend going to my movie that is uh, Cap versus Soch or uh, Capitalism versus Socialism, whatever I call it, and it's on, done on a Freyer chart. If you'd like a copy of that, just please let me know. That does a lot more detail than this. And of course, what is the main sort of thing here? It's actually size of government. And sorry, you sort of use big over here. And even more than big, probably a better word is active. Okay, uh, the people on the right, they prefer a limited size of government. Okay, the next thing I would say is uh, 
Let's, uh, like I've just been commenting about free enterprise, freedom of a contract. So I, as the uh, consumer, am free to search out where I would like to uh, get the goods and services I'm seeking. Uh, likewise, as a business owner, I am free to seek out potential customers. I could even deny potential customers. On the Marxism side, you see that that is not that is eliminated, and partly that is because this is a, there's an elimination of private property. There are fewer places to get goods and services that you may need. The government controls those things, and in many cases, you are required to get the goods and services you may require from the government and the government only. And so this is what is sort of a socialist goal. Uh, and certainly Marx's goal is that the government uh, is always involved. Now you may say, well, Mr. Ryan, you told us that Marx sought to eventually eliminate government in the long run, a utopic state. Fair enough. I did say that, and that you could make the argument. Uh, but before that ever happens, Marx did argue that the government had to get involved. The government had to take control of the owning the means of production. And again, over here, the Smith side is the laissez-faire side. Obviously, complete opposites. The keeping out of the affairs of the business person, of business people, of owners, etc. And so one of these things is uh, we talk about freedom of movement. Um, a lot of times in, in medieval Europe, you know, you stayed where you grew up. You never really went anywhere. You couldn't move to the city to try to get a better job. This is sort of the concept of free enterprise as well. Freedom of movement is also part of, in similar in sense, to freedom of contract. I sort of put over here, violence is okay. Marx was very, uh, very much fond of saying that change could only come uh, with violence and that violence was certainly, uh, if not necessary, uh, but also accepted to get change to occur. The next one I would say is, of course, the desire of the socialist Marxist was the elimination of classes. Uh, classes are, if classes are in, uh, eliminated, that everyone can be equally cared for. And then you sort of see this in the long run utopic idea that Marx believed in. Uh, classes are generally, just by their nature, unfair. If you recall, he talked about changes in society throughout history have been done, have been caused by uh, conflict between the classes. Whereas Smith said, uh, there is a innate, there is a natural desire by some people to improve their their situation, to improve their status, and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with social mobility. The individual should be able to individually pursue the level of success they can achieve. And part of this is not just hard work. Part of this is brains, isn't it? As well, there are some people that have the mental ability and capacity to solve problems to do brain surgery, things like that, and that should not stop somebody from some sort of level of success. And of course, this has to do with private ownership. The Smith side, the right side, is always in favor of private ownership, and of course, obviously, to eliminate class, you know, what creates a class? I have more stuff than you have. So you eliminate stuff, then you, if you eliminate stuff, then you eliminate classes. And what do you achieve? You achieve this man-made utopia. That utopia can be achieved uh, without the help of God. In fact, we're going to eliminate God on this side uh, because the only way to get this to happen is to, this utopia to happen is for man to do it, for government to do it. Whereas Smith did not believe that. Nature, of course, just by saying that word, you're implying some sort of something above and beyond man. Man sometimes can control nature, but many times man cannot control nature. Uh, just the implication here is an implication of a higher being. And this comes down to where is the quality occur? This we're getting into, you're starting to see me, hear me say this, equal opportunities. When are you equal? You're equal at birth. You're equal at the beginning. You all have equal opportunities, okay? Whereas this side says we're going to, at the end, equality is at the beginning. Over here, we're going to say equality is at the end. We're going to force everyone, for lack of a better way of putting it, we're going to force everyone to be equal by the end. You can see the flaws. There's, there's certainly arguments and flaws and debates about both. 
All right. And so why or do we do this on the Marxist side? Because we are interested in the greater good. We we do these things. We redistribute. How about this? Do you remember this term? The redistribution, redistribution of wealth is for the greater good. Whereas the Smith side said the law of self-interest, the law of nature, this will make everything work because this is human nature to try to improve themselves. And then the last thing I'll just sort of say here is this concept of rivalry one more time. Rivalry is good to uh, the Smithist. <laughs> How about that term, the Smithist? Whereas the Marxist wants to try to eliminate rivalry uh, and rivalry, the elimination of rivalry will help with all those other things. All right, so that is the end of that chart. Okay, I hope you see the difference here. I hope you, uh, this is a sort of a, I don't know, I guess some people would say this is a simplistic way to look at it, but I think this is uh, instructive regardless. Uh, regardless, this is a, is a way to sort of really differentiate between the two sides. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that discussion today, and we'll be looking forward to continuing with the uh, discussion about uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution, but also politi the political spectrum as well. All right. Aloha.